The hangings of the court being only about half as high as the walls of the tabernacle, the building could be plainly seen by the people without. So the sanctuary was tall enough that you, they could see it from their tent. But once the believer was inside, you couldn't see the believer. They were covered with his righteousness. Exodus 27, 1 and 2 says, And thou shalt make an altar of chicken wood five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it on the four corners thereof, his form shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. The articles of furniture in the courtyard were covered with brass. And thou shalt make the purpose of the brass of it is to reveal. When they had mirrors in the place, they didn't have mirrors in my They had mirrors out of brass. And I've seen some of the rest areas out west. Uh, mirror made out of brass, you can see not, not as good as our mirror, but you can see reasonably good. And so that would reveal their sin, they could confess their sin. Now, one of the things that's a consistent lesson throughout the sanctuary is that God gave great detail of exactly how it was to be made what the size was, and how it was to be made. Yes. This is supposed to teach us that God is particular. We as humans have a tendency to say, well, if we can come close, it's okay. Good enough. God says, no, it has to be exact. And the same is true in our character development. We cannot be satisfied with partial uh, compliance to what God has said, but it has to be exact. And He helps us, we don't have to do it alone, but we have to accept the standard of having it exactly like He said. In Exodus 30, verses 18 and 19, it says, Thou shalt also make a labor of brass. So in the articles of furniture in the courtyard, there was wood inside, and it was covered with brass. The wood represents humanity, and the metal represents uh, God's ability. To watch with all, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacles of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein, for Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. So we are saved by the blood and the water. Not just by the blood, but by blood and water. Sometimes people get the idea, it doesn't really matter if I get baptized or not. They know I love Jesus. Yes, it does matter. Baptism is the water part. But if we're not converted through the blood, then baptism doesn't mean anything. So it takes both. And this uh, setup is telling us that. Also, we see here. The importance of cleanliness in worshiping God. And before the priest could go in to the sanctuary, he had to wash both his hands and his feet before going in. And so this teaches us lessons for today of cleanliness when we come to God's house 
and to make sure both her clothing and her person are clean because if we want to worship God, that's what it requires. And again, the details are important. God sees uh, the importance of these details. Patriarchs and Prophets, 347. In the court, and near the entrance, stood the reason altar of her prophet. The first thing the Israelite found when they went in the door was this uh, earth offering. Upon this altar were consumed all the sacrifices made by fire unto the Lord, and its forms were sprinkled with the atoning blood. The reason for the horns, this represents power. You know, uh, the horns give the animal power, and so it represents God's power to heal and to restore. Between the altar and the door of the tabernacle was the labor, which was also a brass, made from the mirrors that had been the free will offering of the women of Israel. So the courtyard was to be on earth. When we think about the heavenly sanctuary, the courtyard was on earth. And so the altar, the raised altar, represented the cross of Calvary, where Jesus would die on that cross. He would die on earth. And the heavenly sanctuary doesn't have a courtyard because the courtyard was to be on earth. In Science of the Times of April 14, 1881, the glory of God held the sanctuary, and for this reason, the priests never entered the place sanctified by the divine presence with shoes upon their feet. So in order to really impress upon them the importance of the presence of God, it's like Moses, when he drew near the burning bush, had to take his shoes off. So the priest had to take his shoes off, wash his feet before he went in the sanctuary. Particles of dust might cleave to them, which would desecrate the holy place. Therefore, the priests were required to leave their shoes in the court before entering the sanctuary. In the court, beside the door of the tabernacle, stood a brazen layer, wherein the priests washed their hands and their feet before going in to minister before the Lord. All who officiated in the sanctuary were required of God to make special preparation to enter the place where his glory was revealed. Now there was another lesson that is very important in this. You know, the spiritual lessons are even more important than the physical lessons. And the physical lesson is, all dirt stays outside of the sanctuary. But, what it's telling us is that we should not come to church, we should not come to worship God with sins on our record. Those need to be confessed before we get here. And we need to be clean spiritually. We need to have everything out of the way before we come. Now, of course, if somebody's a visitor or someone that doesn't understand all this yet, God accepts uh, the best they can offer, but those of us that do know, and through a study of the sanctuary, 
We should know that it's very important to not appear before God dirty inside, with our characters uh, tainted by sins that have not been confessed. So we are doubly that way because we're living in the day of judgment ever since October 22, 1844, and yet so many people uh, come to church and they didn't bother to confess any sins or get cleaned up before they came. Some don't even come clean in their persons, in their clothing. So uh, we really need to come up on that. In Gospel Workers, page 173, says, Thus was constantly taught the lesson that all the Bible must be put away from those who have come into the presence of God. So we need to take time before we come to church and make sure that our record is clean again. God doesn't say, well, you sinned too many times, so I can't clean you up, praise the Lord. He says, just bring them to me. I will clean you up. So that we can go. And we especially see this in the communion service. It talks about in Corinthians eating unworthily. What does it mean to do that? It means that our sins have not been all confessed. And we are maybe even practicing a sin on a regular basis. That we, uh, you know, we know it's wrong, but we just keep on doing it. And to come and expect to get the blessing of communion is not, you know, appropriate. We need to be clean of all of those sins. When we go to the table of sugar, <clears throat> inside now, the sanctuary. Exodus 25, 23 through 30. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. So the ones outside were covered with brass, but on the inside they were covered with gold. The gold represents perfect character of Jesus. It represents what Jesus can do to us. And that gold with the light that was shining in there was dazzling, actually, from what I've read. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. So the flat part of the table down was wood covered with gold, but there was a crown around the top, and that was pure gold. And that's because it illustrates two different things. The pure gold represents divinity, and the wood covered with gold represents humanity covered with divinity. And so uh, Jesus had a human nature covered with divinity, and he wants to do the same for us. But he was also divine, so the, at some points in the sanctuary there's a pure goal. <clears throat> and thou shalt set on the table showbread before me always. So on top of the table, they were to have what was called showbread. It was actually two stacks of six. Uh, huge pancakes, we might call them, and these were baked and placed in the sanctuary every Sabbath. Interesting. Now you know that Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and so the bread is a representation of Jesus, and the putting it there on Sabbath is, is a reminder that it's on Sabbath that Jesus gives us the most bread. 
And so we uh, are not to neglect the Sabbath. In Chronicles 9, uh, 1 Chronicles uh, 9.32 says the sons of the Kohathites were over the showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. This was not doing wrong. God commanded it to prepare this fresh on Sabbath. What a blessing it would be if every pastor could give fresh bread on Sabbath in the church. But sad to say, we read uh, sleeping pastors speaking to sleeping congregations. No fresh bread there. That's the sad reality in many places today. But God said way back then, I want in the worship of Sabbath, I want fresh bread to be given. Exodus 30, 1, verse 1 and 3. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of shinted wood shalt thou make it. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof, round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. So the same thing was true of the altar of incense. From the top of it down was wood covered with gold, but there was a crown of gold on the top. And this, of course, is where the incense would be offered. And later we'll We'll study more about the services. Patriarchs and Prophets 348. The table of showbread stood on the north. With its ornamental crown, it was overlaid with pure gold. On this table, the priests were each Sabbath and placed 12 cakes arranged in two piles and sprinkled the frankincense, the loaves that were removed, being accounted holy, were to be eaten by the priests. So every Sabbath, they took the old ones out, the priests ate them, and they put the new ones, the fresh ones, there. Now the reason for 12 is that every tribe was represented. The represented there uh, through Jesus. Patriarchs and Prophets 348. Just before the veil separating the holy place from the most holy and the immediate presence of God stood the golden altar of incense. The only thing that divided the two was a curtain. And the curtain did not reach the ceiling, and it didn't reach the floor. And so the Shekinah glory that was in the most holy place would shine out over the top and under the bottom of the curtain. And this altar was bringing the priest during the year, because on the Day of Atonement, he went inside. But as the priest offered the incense, during the year, he was the closest to the uh, ark as he could get. Upon this altar, the priest was to burn incense every morning and evening. And we'll look at that sacrifice. There's a lot of precious lessons there. But twice a day, which represents morning and evening worship, that was offered on that altar. Its horns were touched with the blood of the sin offering, and it was sprinkled with blood on the Day of Atonement. So when the sacrifice was made outside in the courtyard, some of the blood, wasn't always, but a lot of the time, some of the blood was brought in and as the blood was brought in, 
the sins of the people were transferred from them to the sanctuary. That's why the sanctuary had to be cleansed on the Day of Atonement. And now the heavenly sanctuary is being cleansed. In the uh, first volume of Spirit of Prophecy, page 273, it says, Directly before the ark, but separated by the curtain, was the golden altar of incense. The fire on this altar was kindled by the Lord himself and was sacredly cherished by feeding it with holy incense which filled the sanctuary with its fragrant cloud day and night. Now here's a couple of very important points. They were not allowed to light the fire on them. Why? Because we cannot revive ourselves. It's not possible. Only God can revive us. And so he when, when the sanctuary was accepted, when Moses had done everything the way God had instructed him, God came down, and when he did, he lit the fire on that altar. But after that, it was their responsibility to keep it burning. They could never let it go out. Now, sometimes they had to do a lot of work to not let it go out, because they had to pack up the sanctuary and travel some distance and they had to have a container and keep that fire burning. But if they let it go out, that was serious consequences. I don't know of a case where they let it go out, at least during Moses' time. I suppose it happened in the later sanctuaries because they stopped using the sanctuary uh, for periods of time. But but uh, in the Mosaic one, for sure, that never could go out. What does that mean? It means that when we're converted, God puts the fire in our hearts. But he expects us to do some things to keep that fire burning. And if we don't, it goes out. And of course, those things primarily are Studying the Bible, praying, witnessing to others. And if we are faithful in doing those things, it keeps the fire burning. But if we let it go out, you know, it can reconvert us, that's true, but it's dangerous to look forward thinking he will do that. Because many people lose their conversion and they never get it back. Never get it back. And so we need to guard that heavenly fire that he gave to us. And if we haven't had it, we need to get it. He's always willing to do it. But once it's there, we have a part to play in keeping that fire burning. When the priest offered the incense before the Lord, he looked to the mercy seat. So although he only went in the most holy once a year, every day as he was performing his duties, he was looking toward the mercy seat. He couldn't see it, but he was looking there because that is where the power comes from. <clears throat> Although he could not see it, he knew it was there. And as the incense rose on the cloud, the glory of the Lord descended upon the mercy seat and filled the most holy place and was visible in the holy place. And the glory often so filled both apartments that the priest was unable to officiate and was obliged to stand at the door of the tabernacle. So he had a quick response 
through his ministry that the most holy place and to some extent the holy place would light up with the presence of God. What does that mean? Well, sometimes, it doesn't happen every time, but sometimes as we're praying and taking special time to get close to God, it just seems like He floods in and we are aware that His presence is here. The Bible records some experiences <coughs> the ones that were on the way to Emmaus, afterward they were reflecting and they said, did not our hearts burn within us? The Adventists that never has had their heart burn within them hasn't yet received what is available. God wants to come close, just like he did in the sanctuary. And notice sometimes he came so abundantly that the priest had to back up to the door because of God's presence so pronounced there in the sanctuary. <clears throat> the priest in the holy place directed his prayer by faith to the mercy seat, which he could not see represents the people of God directing their prayers to Christ before the mercy seat in the heavenly sanctuary. So here's an important lesson. Why did God arrange it that the priest wouldn't see the mercy seat? Because God knew that we wouldn't be able. You know, it was only the priest that could go in back then. So the rest of the people couldn't see the mercy seat. But by faith, since they knew what was in there, by faith they were to see the mercy seat. And faith has the capacity to make something absolutely real. If we believe what God said, it will be absolutely real to us. And so as we send our prayers up to the heavenly mercy seat, we are to believe that God has heard. And sometimes, like I said, He surrounds us with so much of His presence that we can't doubt at that point. We, we have to. But sometimes we don't have that. And that's when faith is more required. They do not behold their mediator with the natural eye, but with the eye of faith, they see Christ before the mercy seat and direct their prayers to Him and with assurance lay the benefits of His mediation. Now that's because the priest represented Christ as well as the lamb that was offered out in the courtyard. The priest represented Christ. So, we are to focus our prayers upon the fact that Jesus stands before the Father in the heavenly sanctuary and He takes our requests and presents them as His own. For every trusting disciple, He presents our requests as His own. So we don't have to worry about whether our prayer will be heard or not. If it comes from an honest heart, it will be heard, and Jesus will take it and present it to the Father. And we will get an answer that is the very best answer for us every time. So I think that's the last slide. Yeah. So here we have just, in, in the next service, we'll uh, go farther with the furniture and so on. But you can see that uh, what we've looked at so far shows the plan of salvation. It shows, uh, it's a prediction of the Messiah that he would come and die uh, on this earth as the courtyard, that he would die and 
it shows that the Jews were not good students of the sanctuary, so they were not ready for the first coming of Christ. They were expecting a king, not somebody to, to come and die. And yet, they had practiced that sanctuary, those sanctuary services for a long, long time. Now today, we're going to miss just as much if we don't understand the sanctuary. And so out in the courtyard, the whole idea there is to get rid of sin. And the holy place had part of that because the blood was taken inside and every day they had a service that they went through there in the holy place. And this way, as we understand what, why God asked them to make those different articles of furniture, it helps us to understand different aspects of the plan of salvation. Now the believer can only go in where the altar was, a burnt offering. He would come in, bring his offering, and confess his sins over the head of that lamb, and that's as far as he could go. The priest had to do the rest. And the blood. It was just as solid because the priest was representing Jesus, so the believer didn't have to go in there, you know, to do all the rest. Yes. Complete knowledge of the sanctuary message. 
and help us to be used to awaken others to this important message. We believe it will make a difference in our salvation or not, knowing and understanding the lessons that you put in the same